Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Land Freaker Talks. I'm your host, Chris. And for those who are new to the show, this is a show that's focused on amplifying diverse viewpoints on AI technology and data. We strive to cultivate an inclusive platform where diverse perspectives thrive, reshaping the conversation to reflect a more equitable understanding of AI's impact on our world. So very glad to have you all here. Today we have our guest, Elizabeth Seleski, a truly honored and distinguished guest where I have known her for quite a while and have followed most of her really, really great research works. Elizabeth is a PhD student at John Hopkins University. Her research primarily focuses on language representations and tokenization for machine translation and multilinguality, including how to create more data efficient and robust models. And today we'll be looking at one of her really wonderful and inspiring work. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. And um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking about how and why we created a recent evaluation set, um, which we're calling the ACL60 evaluation um, data. So here, um, the focus is on how did we do this? Why did we do this? What things can you do with these evaluation sets? Um, and specifically, this was intended for use um, on multilingual speech translation in realistic conditions, which I'll explain in a second, um, here with terminology. And uh, thanks very much to all of my co-authors for helping uh, set this up. So how, why did we go through and do this research and data collection? Um, so something that we uh, would love obviously to do, and you know, I think is shared with the um, motivation for this talk as well, <laughs> is to make technical information more accessible. And so in particular with um, hybrid and virtual talks uh, appearing more in the last few years, we're seeing live captioning at, on talks at, at conferences and other locations. Um, the first initiative I saw along this line was um, at NACL 2019, where there was um, live captioning of all of the talks as they were presented which theoretically is wonderful. This is using the tools that the, t the field itself is developing to help make the field more accessible. Um, but uh, of course, we've all experienced this, which is um, a rather entertaining, uh, um, you know, uh, mistranscribed word. Um, this one is an actual example from iClear 2023 this year. Um, and here I have in kept a, a past um, set of all of the actual ASR mistakes I noticed, for example, at ACL 2020. And so despite the fact that we work on, you know, speech recognition, speech translation, and in exactly the area that creates these tools, I think there's often still a ways for us to go to be able to apply them to the actual area that we work in. So what makes technical talks particularly challenging? There are, um, of course, a number of very specific domain terms um, that will come up when we're talking through technical material. Um, we also have uh, very diverse speaker demographics with hopefully speakers from all around the globe presenting on a wide variety of different topics and content. Um, and this, of course, is gonna lead to a wide variety of both native and non-native English accents. Um, and then the recording conditions are often super variable. So it could be the case that you're standing at a podium kind of far away from a microphone or using a, you know, very nice uh, plug-in microphone in a small uh, soundproof room even in the most extreme case. Um, all of these can make this a little bit more challenging than your typical ASR data set, for example. Um, and so in 2022, there was um, an initiative announced um, through ACL um, to start to translate a lot of the materials in the ACL anthology, which in addition to papers can also include technical uh, talks given at past conferences, which are now archived in the anthology um, into a wide variety of languages, um, potentially up to 60. Um, and so to assess how we're able to do this um, translation, uh, transcription, 
we of course need some amount of um, benchmark data. And so what we set out to do here was to um, translate and transcribe um, some talks from past ACLs into um, here, 10 languages, um, and use this as a way to assess basically our progress in this area. So um, a quick outline, what do I mean by evaluating speech translation under realistic conditions? And then how did we create the data set? And then what are some challenges that we can um, address hopefully using this data? Um, so evaluating under realistic conditions, when we do um, speech recognition and speech translation research, almost always, you know, if you download a data set um, from Hugging Face, it's pre-segmented. We've got maybe sentence level, maybe first level, um, but we've got a fixed segmentation provided with the data set in most cases. Um, whereas when, you know, I'm giving a talk live, um, this is streaming. And so we have to, at some point, make choices about when to start doing transcription, what units and what segments to use. Um, this is all potentially well and good and is a whole research area itself. Um, but when it comes time to evaluate uh, how our system is doing, we'll typically then have a fixed segmentation that the transcription or translation was done by um, whoever uh, provided those annotations. Um, and so evaluating under realistic conditions can often mean resegmenting whatever your system output is in order to match it up with a reference segmentation. Um, and so this is often done using a particular tool uh, created um, now nearly 10 years ago, showing you know the length <laughs> of uh, impact of nicely written software that no one has been able to necessarily replicate and make faster. Um, so uh, with this tool is called um, MWare Segmenter. And so what it's doing is um, segmenting the system output in a way that minimizes the word error rate to a reference segmentation. So I'm going to stream along my hypothesis and just recut it in such a way that it best matches up to the reference. Um, this lets you, for example, compare systems that have different segmentations. So for example, if someone has worked on some type of streaming simultaneous transcription or translation, um, and they've optimized for segments of a particular length, I can compare that to a system that is using a completely different segmentation because they'll all end up matching up to the same references. Something to note, um, I do love tokenization is that this of course does give you, require some amount of um, choice about where boundaries can be placed. Um, and so this will usually be done using some sort of fixed tokenization. So um, we're following the standards that have been used in past um, IDBSLT, which is um, a workshop that works on speech translation evaluation campaigns. Um, uh, and so that is um, character level tokenization for Chinese and Japanese and word level otherwise. And so that just means that when I'm resegmenting, I can only place a boundary at token boundaries, essentially. Um, so for uh, all of our metrics here, um, when we're assessing both system and um, annotator um, uh, output, we're going to use word level error rate um, for transcription. Um, and so uh, that'll be here always in English. And then for translation, we're using um, a few different metrics because they tend to pick up on slightly different things about your system. And so always a good sign to have multiple when possible. And then as well, we're gonna use um, translation error rate to assess the required post editing. And so translation error rate is essentially just giving an additional level of freedom uh, to the output. And so um, if, for example, something needs to be reordered, um, that'll be weighted differently than it would be in word error rate. Um, and so what is the typical pipeline going through to create evaluation data? Um, this is you know, something that's incredibly important. We use uh, data sets for common data sets for almost all of our research, but to actually create those data sets is um, a multi-step process. And so the very first thing, of course, is selecting appropriate data. Um, and uh, then once we have, in this case, selected um, the set of technical talks that we're gonna use, um, the first step is going to be automatic transcription. And so that's going to potentially vary in quality based on the system used, the um, demographics and content of the talk itself, 
um, and then we'll use human post editors to correct it. Um, for better, for worse, and these days, it is mostly the case that, uh, for example, professional companies who um, do this type of work will only post edit in many cases. So you may see this um, as a good or a bad thing, depending on your perspective. Um, it means that there might be some biases uh, due to the original system that they're correcting, um, which you know, it, it is what it is in many cases, but um, it's something that's, of course, good to know. Um, so in this case, we had um, professionals first post edit the, uh, the transcripts we got automatically, and then we had a domain expert, um, for example, the co-authors on this paper, um, go through and fine tune um, and check the technical terms, because that, of course, requires a background and familiarity to, for example, know that an acronym should be spelled a particular way and isn't, in fact, you know, a particular word um, and get the terminology right. Um, then, of course, uh, if you want to be able to assess terminology um, uh, within your downstream system, you might need annotations. So we also had people go through and annotate the spans containing terminology in the technical talks. Now, all of this was done at the segmentation that was most appropriate for the original um, speech recognition system we used to transcribe. And I'll go into all this in more detail in a second. But... Um, then we have, might need to do something like resegment to make the, um, the talks more appropriate, either for evaluation or for the downstream translation. And so then we'd actually translate the talks and again, have them post edited. So it's a potentially long process and you have to be pretty careful about your choices in each one of them, but, um, we've done our best and, uh, hopefully describing this might be useful to people trying to do something similar in the future. Um, so going through these stages uh, here, the first thing we do um, is data selection. So what this means is both what languages are we going to use um, and then uh, what um, talks are we actually going to have transcribed and translated. So all of the talks that we um, were looking at were given at ACL 2022 and included in the ACL anthology. So this is wonderful because it means they're now um, in the public domain um, and able to be basically used to help <laughs> further uh, additional NLP science um, downstream. Um, so all of them were given in English. Um, and so the information about each talk that we have is whatever the metadata that we have on the anthology um, and the associating paper, for example. So we know um, the track that the talk was potentially presented in um, at the conference, um, where people have provided their L1 um, in a demographic survey that we sent to authors of talks that we were potentially going to include. Um, we know their L1. Um, and then if they optionally provided their gender, um, we have uh, that as well. So our goals here were to try and have a diverse set of um, speaker and talk uh, content um, uh, contained in this set. We ideally wanted to strive for a gender balance that matched that of the current field. So um, we have the high level aggregate um, uh, demographic survey um, results from ACL 2022, which suggests that there are about 30% female uh, participation at that conference, for example. So here um, we tried to have a similar balance in our data set. Um, the target languages, uh, you may know, are a little bit skewed in the particular language families they come from. And here is something that's uh, kind of unfortunate, but an un uh, a current state of the field, which is in order to use these data sets for evaluation, people have to be able to potentially make systems to provide outputs to then use um, these eval sets. So what that means is we weren't going to be able to collect enough data to make um, training data for this case um, because we're using professional companies for uh, the transcription and translation. Um, and unfortunately, data annotation is just, it's really costly in some cases, um, particularly when you, for each talk, are going to have um, one pass for transcription and then 10 different translators uh, in this case. What that means is that we chose the languages from the ACL 6060 initiative that had at least one publicly available data set for training already released. Um, the goal there being that 
with other training data, people would be able to spin up systems and hopefully use this. Now, um, this is not necessarily ideal um, in the sense that there are a lot of areas of the world and many language families not represented here. Um, and of course, if we only make data sets for the languages that already have data available, that's going to continue to become a larger rather than smaller gap. Um, so it's something to be aware of. Um, and some, but not all of the data collection and curation techniques we used here would transfer to other languages because of this. Um, so just highlighting that as a, a thing to be for better, for worse aware of. But um, here, what we did essentially was um, select uh, 10 talks total so that we would end up with um, about 500 sentences per dev and eval set, um, which is about an hour of speech um, and five technical talks. Um, this is relatively small, and it means that some areas, um, speaker demographics are going to be represented by potentially a single talk. Um, but uh, it's an interesting thing to think about because when we think of, you know, common machine translation data sets, we have only about the equivalent of two or so hours of speech potentially for each of our eval sets. So it's something that we might not actively think about without annotations for those types of um, demographics content, um, but um, we're potentially relatively limited in um, scope. So these are a little bit smaller than some um, publicly available data sets, but hopefully are going to give us more coverage than there was before. So quick uh, shot of the talk metadata. So this is the, um, the metadata that we have and was collected for each one of these um, talks that we were selecting. So um, on average, talks are about 11, 12 minutes, which makes sense if you think that they're from ACL. And I think the um, talk limit was actually supposed to be 12 minutes. Um, and so we've aimed for um, different tracks and within the track, um, different focuses. So we would cover different technical content. Um, it also means you'll look between the two sets that these are ideally best used together um, because they cover different content. So if you tune very heavily to the dev set, you're going to potentially miss um, a lot of the content that you could have by also using the eval set. Um, so we're hoping people will report on both and use, um, yeah, whatever techniques they find for one set should hopefully be generalizable to the other. Um, as opposed to fine tuning very closely on one particular um, speaker demographic, for example. Um, the uh, ASR we're using here is commercially available. Um, this is a public API. Um, and so this is from the um, Azure system. Um, so this is first going to perform speaker diarization, which here is typically just going to be um, splitting um, based on voice activity. So when people pause, when they're switching slides, things like this, this might result in an implicit segment boundary. Um, and so this ended up automatically segmenting the talks into about 30 second segments. Um, coming back to it, once we finalize the data, it looks like about 93% of words were correctly transcribed by the initial ASR pass. Um, which is pretty good. Uh, if you look at them though, the ones that are um, incorrect are typically, of course, exactly the technical content that we'd want to get correct. Um, so, you know, when we look at word error rate, for example, this is of course gonna be a bit of a skewed look at what our actual target is. Um, and so here's, um, for example, some, some uh, of the mistakes that we see um, in terms of, um, you know, bias TM uh, as bias TM, um, character embeddings instead as kitchen embeddings, which, you know, doesn't necessarily make any more sense, but, uh, you know, sure, it does sound phonetically similar. Um, and so from here, we had human post editors go through with um, a multi-tier process to review. And so they're going to be able to see the slides. This is a nice thing that's kind of unique to the setting because we're transcribing technical talks. So there are slides that might be able to help when you look, for example, at something like BioSTM, that might be an acronym on a slide. And so someone could easily correct it or potentially a multimodal system might be able to pick up on that and make um, some correction down, downstream. Um, and we were trying to standardize this fluencies. Um, and uh, then finally, we had a domain expert. Um, so 
a researcher in the field correct further technical terms. And there was still some amount, uh, about 3% that needed correction. So then something that can be really handy for um, targeted uh, you know, tasks in addition to translation are just looking at labeling technical terms automatically. This is something that's really helpful for humans, for example, uh, when doing translation. And so this might be something that could be used downstream as an assistive task. Um, and so what we did was we tried to um, uh, automatically label those terms that um, appeared in the list created by the 6060 initiative. Um, this is uh, first going to be on the source side in English. Um, and so this is relatively small. This is certainly not all of the terms that are going to be spoken at any one conference or even necessarily in any one talk. Um, and we're hoping that, you know, these are going to be still useful to bootstrap uh, downstream work. Um, they are then um, labeled on the target sides as well, um, but starting from uh, the English and then looking at the output translations and trying to match them up. Um, then uh, we're going to go through and do sentence segmentation. So here the main goal is to have segments that make sense for translation in all of the target languages we have. So for example, when we're translating between say um, English and French or English and Japanese, which have dramatically different word orders, if we segment in certain places, it will lead to differences in translation or potentially missing context in one language versus another. Um, so the voice activity detection can lead to a very wide distributions of lengths as well. So some segments might just be a couple words when someone had a restart um, at the beginning of a sentence, um, and it might not necessarily be the content we want for translation. Um, there are also other alternatives, for example, subtitles, which are really helpful in a lot of um, practical cases, but not necessarily um, super helpful in a very multilingual setting where we want the same segments to be used for all languages. So if someone wanted to look at translating between non-English centric pairs, which is something that we hope is going to continue to be more of a focus going down the line, um, they'll still be able to use the same segments. So here are a couple quick examples just to show the dramatic um, differences in, for example, um, segment length with voice activity detection um, in different uh, parts of a talk. Um, subtitles are much more consistent, but as you can see, very few of them actually span just one sentence. You might have segments that are bits of two different sentences. Um, it might not necessarily be the case that you have all the content or context to translate words in the beginning or end of a subtitle correctly just from that one subtitle. And so this can be a little bit trans, um, uh, complicated for translation, for example. Some sentences are often going to be variable, but hopefully are um, the most appropriate unit for, for translation, at least. Um, here's another example where you can, again, see the extreme. So VID before had like 50 words for one. Here we have just three uh, tokens in some cases, depending on the context. Um, and so, yeah, the distributions are just very different potentially. And this can play into uh, differences between models depending on how they're trained. Um, so moving right along, um, the next step is to take the sentences that we've just manually annotated. Um, because we wanted to make sure that for eval data, this is as high quality as we can get it, um, and use uh, commercial MT models as a first pass for translation. So we used um, modern MT for the nine out of 10 language pairs that were supported and Azure for uh, Farsi, which was not supported by modern MT. Um, so this is a reasonable first pass. And we did say the con the consistency was pretty good between, for example, different talks um, and, which is interesting because they all had very different um, focus con uh, focuses and topic areas. Um, what you'll see in this very large table full of numbers is basically that um, there, there's not as much of a range as you might expect um, across some languages. Um, and it is the case that some metrics pick up on very different aspects of this task. So I'll get into this a bit more in a second. but. Um, it's not the case that, for example, if you just looked at any one metric, you'd have a sense, for example, of how much effort it would take to post-edit um, to final uh, final translation quality. 
And here, for example, you'll see that um, when people are doing this first pass uh, post editing, um, they are looking at potentially the annotated spans with the terminology. So they have a sense for what to particularly pay attention to. Um, and uh, here they may not be using the slides. Um, so uh, I guess what I wanna highlight here, <laughs> um, before I've shown you translation error rate, I just wanna reiterate that these metrics are not yet necessarily the most indicative of how much effort it would take someone to post edit these talks to um, final uh, reference quality um, with you know only moderate correlations and sometimes negative correlation in the case of blue. Um, what we do see is most uh, highly correlated is looking at the amount of reordering that is necessary. So um, here, what we've done is just look at those tokens that are matched between the original um, first pass automatic uh, um, output and the final reference and seeing how far they're uh, needing to be moved within um, the sentence um, by uh, a professional. And so it seems like that is actually the uh, you know quickest proxy for for how much effort it's going to take and how much time it's going to take to post edit these. Um, and as you might expect, this is partially biased by both the source language and the system used. So, for example, Japanese with a much wider uh, difference um, in potential word ordering from English. Um, if a system is biased towards uh, outputting more English-like uh, word ordering, that is actually um, what took the most effort, not necessarily the terminology. Um, there was some variability across talks, um, likely due to the technical content, um, but generally um, this is something that's um, about the talk as opposed to the language. Um, so finally, uh, just quickly talking about the um, types of things that were uh, edited in the final span. Um, so most of the um, terminology was correctly translated once it was corrected in the transcription. So this is pretty cool. Um, but uh, about 25, 35% were um, manually corrected by post editors. And then for those terms that were um, potentially uh, very um, particularly technical, not able to have um, a clear translation into a target language, they were left in English. Um, and so looking right along, <laughs> um, so what are the types of things that we might want to um, assess with uh, these evaluation sets? So something that's um, under active development is of course, uh, the way that we segment speech in either simultaneous um, or uh, large, um, uh, talk uh, translation. And so um, how to assess this on things like TED Talks or something like this, where it's not necessarily conversational domain, you don't have as many cues about, for example, um, natural breaks in uh, the content of the talk. Um, sometimes we need something a bit more matched to our final, uh, final task to um, really get a sense for how our systems do. And so um, what I want to highlight here is just um, that this is uh, potentially a place that we, we can assess um, automatic segmentation. And so what we're going to see, though, is that models are often optimized for the segment links observed in training. So, for example, if you use a really high quality model, like, for example, Whisper, um, it's been trained on much longer segments than most uh most other public models where potentially um, we use something like, I don't know, a few second segments. Um, and so what that also means is that if you evaluate on mismatched conditions, like if you use our sentence level segmentation that we're providing, Whisper is going to do worse than it should. Um, and so, uh, for example, the sentences are shorter than the segments often used in Whisper's training data. And Whisper is further going to do um, an initial um, voice activity detection step and resegment the input given to it. So they'll actually be further segmented um, before given the actual out, um, uh, transcription. And so um, doing, uh, you know, potentially whatever the native appropriate um, training uh, condition um, segmentation was for a given model, uh, even when evaluating with these sets, is important. Um, and so 
that's just something I want to mention and highlight. And I definitely suggest that rescoring with resegmentation um, be the default for this data set. Um, this is something we're seeing increasingly in evaluation campaigns, but not necessarily in, for example, research papers on public data, which is gold segmented. And so I think thinking about the potential use case for that model when it's being evaluated up front can be really helpful. Um, so yes, um, this is something that, yeah, could be used uh, for. Um, something else, of course, is just um, the way that we uh, assess um, performance across demographics um, is something we need to you know, be, highlight a bit more in um, our evaluation going forward. Um, and so something that we noticed when um, running initial uh, evaluation with um, publicly available models here, for example, Whisper again, um, is that we actually see a greater discrepancy in performance across talks and across speakers when using multilingual versions of models, um, which, you know, can potentially make sense if you think about the way that um, you certain phones might be pronounced in context in one language versus another. And this might influence the way that um, a downstream ASR model then um, picks up on a um, particular uh, variety of English. Um, and so this is something that as we train increasingly large multilingual models, we're going to have to be um, careful and aware of to ensure that we're not increasing um, differences in performance across different speakers. Um, and so I've got additional results here on the slide, but I'm going to, I'm going to breeze right through them. Um, but yeah, finally, um, you know, one of the, uh, initial motivations translating in the technical do domain and how well our systems are able to translate terminology. Um, so the way that we often assess this in research, um, is through things like fine tuning, um, or by, uh, doing some sort of constrained decoding. But in a lot of potential use cases, like for here, if we wanted to translate English talks into a foreign language, um, that's going to be the inverse of the actual case that we have at application time. So a lot of the technical um, domain data we have is in English. A lot of the annotations we have are in English. And so something like constrained decoding works best when we have both parallel data or if we have some sort of um, augmented language model, that is gonna be most helpful in the target language rather than the source. And so um, hopefully by having dedicated um, evaluation sets for the technical domain, we can start to work on techniques that will work in the opposite case where most of the labels are actually in the source rather than target language. Um, so right now we see that, yeah, um, a lot of the terminology isn't necessarily correct in the target languages. Um, without the ability to do these types of uh, techniques, um, just using even high quality commercial models. Um, so yeah, now that we've got these uh, post-edited uh, high quality references, hopefully um, we can do some more research here. Um, and so of course there are always limitations, no matter how uh, well or um, carefully we've attempted to create a data set, but um, the way that we collect our data, the way that we use post-editing um, is potentially going to bias the types of translations we get compared to if we had someone translate from scratch only given the talk material in the source language. Um, this might potentially influence evaluation and lead to higher metrics for models that aren't necessarily better, but are more similar to the original model used for the first pass. Um, the evaluation sets here are relatively moderate size. Um, so we've got an hour of speech and about 500 sentences per um, eval set, which is um, reasonable, but potentially still small. And so we do recommend that people use both the dev and eval sets to um, get a better sense for generalizability and not to overfit. Um, there is definitely a limited set of speakers. We only have 10 people here re uh, represented. Um, and I have not shown anything here about um, how uh, this, you know, using resegmentation might correspond to human evaluation of systems, but um, there's uh, additional work that um, can be pointed to for that. Um, so essentially what I'm trying to describe here is our motivation for creating um, eval sets uh, for this type of uh, material. 
And some of the um, current um, issues that we see in even very high quality models like Whisper, which on clean recording, uh, like liberty speech has, you know, single digit uh, word error rates. But as soon as we go towards the technical domain, we have a wide variety of speakers. We're seeing performance in, you know, say 20 or so. Um, and so there's a clear drop off in a lot of cases from the type of content we often um, do our research on. Um, and I'm hoping that the way that we've described how we do this might be helpful to some uh, people looking to create more data um, to support more research as well. But um, yeah, uh, our data is um, hosted on the ACL anthology. And if anyone um, you know is interested in using it, has any questions about any of the processes that we went through here, of course, please feel free to contact um, us and you know let us know. So yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been really, really interesting. Really wonderful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for taking us through your work. And I completely agree with you. When you're creating data, I really like the point of realistic conditions, right? Because it changes a lot of things. Most of the the data creation work that we do in, in AI is under unrealistic conditions. <laughs> we create this perfect, like you said, libre speech, perfect data, yeah. perfect everything. <laughs> and then we do the research, we get fantastic results. And then when we want to <laughs> deploy them, <laughs> story changes. So it's yep. really interesting that you walked us through creating a data set in the realistic conditions. And and one, one thing I noticed was that so I think the first couple of slides where you showed the the process, it was long. And yeah. <laughs> when you're doing in realistic conditions, I know that it's really long. It's longer than when everything is perfect, right? Like, I mean, you 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 even chose 10 well-represented languages and it was still long. There's a lot of editing. There's a lot of looking at the correlation of these research metrics we're using and the real life metrics that can give us some real life indications. And it, there's a lot of post editing, the human in the loop process, and it's super expensive. Yeah, yeah. I I feel you. This is this has been <laughs> very, 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 very interesting. Um, so now we go into the other side of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do here, we're going to, it's really to...